Chapter 9, Cupid's Arrow Mom is sitting on the floor in the living room with papers spread around her like a fan. It's another Friday night, and me, Ma, and Grandpa have gone to church for a potluck. I'm at the dining room table staring at one single blank sheet of paper. I have to give a speech on Monday, and according to Mrs. Roman, it has to be a demonstration speech where I teach the class something. Other than wheelies in the chair and how to whistle with two fingers, I'm out of ideas. You want tea? I yell over my shoulder. Yes, please. And then after a minute, but honey, you don't have to scream. This house isn't big enough for that. I bring us two mugs of chamomile and the Thin Mints from Meemaw's Girl Scout cookie stash in the freezer. So what are you doing, I say, leaning over the papers. At first, I think they're essays she's grading, because she's been subbing a lot for the teacher who just had a baby. But I didn't think they let subs grade papers. Careful there. She wipes the crumbs off the top sheet and then starts to turn it over. But I catch a few words at the top and grab it. Autumn leaves assisted living. My throat closes up. What is this? She sets down her tea and sweeps her hand over the whole pile, gathering it up like a stack of cards. This, Ellie, is just in case. I've been talking with Dr. Hirschman and trying to come up with a plan for what to do when we can't take care of Grandpa anymore. No. I roll back and hot tea from the mug sloshes over my legs. That's why we're here, Mom. To take care of him so he doesn't have to go anywhere else. You heard me, Ma. We are family. This is what we do. Mom's the fixer, but putting Grandpa in a home isn't a fix. It's giving up. She's breaking all the rules. I've never wanted to get up and run out of the room more in my life. Ellie, listen, I know we're family, but I also know what happens when you leave it too long. It's not good for anyone. She rubs her forehead. You think I want to put my father anywhere? She's acting like she's talking, trying to talk it through with me, but she's really not. She's talking at me. She thinks because I'm 12, I won't understand. So that's it then? He does a few things that inconvenience people and we ship him off. I tip my chair back like a horse rearing up and then let it thump down hard. It's the closest thing I can do to a stomp and it's not nearly good enough. She doesn't answer. I feel the tears start and the words come before I can stop them. Is that what you'll do to me then if I get to be too much for you to handle? Do you have a file of homes for me too? There, I've said it. The thing I've never even let myself wonder until now. Because mom would never do that. Except I never thought she'd put grandpa in a home. And here we are. I'm crying and I hate it. And I see her looking at me like she wants to cry or hug me. And I can't handle that either. No, Ellie. Oh, never. I don't want to hear it. I know she'd never really do it. But I feel dizzy. Like the air has been sucked out of the room. And I want to lay my head against something cool a window pane, a glass of ice water, until everything stops spinning. I roll away and down the hall so I can be alone in the dark. Everybody says what they want you to hear until they change their minds. I thought we had an unspoken code, Mom and me. When Dad left, when the seizures were so bad, when I hardly had a friend at school, when we came here, no matter what happened, we had each other. Because family is family, but I guess not. I guess family is only family as long as it's convenient. I mean, I know what's going on with Grandpa is not like what's going on with me. I'm not getting sicker. I'm not a danger to myself or other people. It's different, but it feels the same. There was a girl, Rita, at my elementary school, who I never told Mom about. She was in my grade, but was already two or three years older. She had CP and some other stuff, too. She drooled and wore a bib and couldn't talk much, but she seemed to understand what was going on. She would follow us with her eyes in the playground from her motorized wheelchair in the shade. They bust her in every day from the children's home. That's what it was, a children's home for disabled kids whose parents couldn't take care of them. I don't know if they just gave up or maybe they were old or poor or had too many kids to look after. Whatever it was, Rita ended up in the home. They always dressed her bad, mom jeans and old Disney sweatshirts, so she looked like a giant toddler. And even though I know they probably did their best to keep her clean, 
She always smelled funny, like hospital sheets and diapers. She was at school for only a couple of months, and then one day she was just gone, off the roster, and nobody told us what happened. One look at autumn leaves, and all I can think of is Rita. Saturday is glittering bright with the sun, shining off the ice on the grass. Mom didn't say a word to me last night when she finally came to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night needing to go to the bathroom, but stayed awake and held it until my stomach cramped. I wasn't about to ask her for help. I tried praying to keep my mind off it. I prayed for Grandpa to be healed and for Mom to settle down and for Coralie to win the beauty pageant and for me to get strong enough to walk better so I won't need help from anybody ever. I hoped God or Jesus or whoever was listening. Now I'm mixing up a batch of snowball cookies after lunch because I don't want to talk to anybody or work on my speech. I'm just licking the spoon and wondering if I could make pie crust out of this almond, almondy sweetness for the contest in May when someone knocks on the front door. Well, who do we have here? Grandpa says and steps back from the door. I lean back from the kitchen to look down the hallway. You can see just about every room in this place if you lean back a little. For a minute, I don't recognize him. His dark hair is slicked back and he's in a suit so white it hurts my eyes. He's holding a giant bouquet of red roses that match his bow tie. I roll down the hall slowly, like I'm on my way to the principal's office. When I get up close, I see a sticker for Food & Co. on the green plastic wrap around the flowers, and then he kind of throws them at me and I have to catch them in my lap, which sends a dust of powdered sugar from my hands in his general direction. Bert? I say like I'm talking to a tiger that's gotten loose from the zoo. What are you doing? And then I calculate back in my mind to that first visit to school and those posters I have seen on the bulletin boards ever since, and it clicks. It's the second weekend in February. No, uh-huh. I brush the flowers off my lap and onto the floor, and then I back out of the doorway. I am not going to the Valentine's Day dance. Bert opens his mouth. I hold up my hand like a crossing guard. No, I say. Do you know how many bad movies there are where the poor little crippled girl goes to the dance? No way. I am not sitting in a corner while everybody drinks Hawaiian punch and takes selfies and tries to dance like Beyonce. I can see it in my head. Me sitting at the edge of the some sad strobe light while everyone around me pretends not to see. I look at Bert in his two white suit and two big shoes. Wallflowers unite. No thank you. Mom and Mima join Grandpa at the door behind me. Bert bends down and picks up the flowers, totally calm. Well, hon, Mima says, why don't you let the boy get a word in edgewise? I point a finger at her. You're in on this, aren't you? Mima winks and Grandpa looks at his shoes. Mom is currently the only one who looks as confused as me. Who said anything about going to the dance, Bert says, and I'm spinning around between people trying to figure out if this is one big joke. We're not going to the dance? Nope, Coralie says, stepping up beside Bert and scaring the daylights out of me. She came from behind the holly tree again, wearing her red dress from Christmas Eve, but now she's covered in glitter and has a headband with a heart-shaped antenna on her head. She looks like a very shimmery ladybug. Do you think for one second I would go to a middle school dance? Lame, she says. So where are we going then? It's a surprise. Then I still say no. Bert holds up his hands like a boy scout. I promise, where we are going, you will not have to dance. And then he places the flowers gently on my lap. Promise on your most favorite purse? It's a satchel. Promise on your most favorite satchel? I promise. All right, all right. Rock on, Coralie yells. You have exactly half an hour until this ship sails. Meemaw turns to Mom and smiles. You don't mind, do you, Alice? I told Bert's dad you'd drive. Mom and Coralie follow me into the bedroom. I stare into the closet like it will magic the perfect, the perfect outfit out of thin air. But how do you pick what to wear when you don't know where you're going? Warm or cold? Definitely jacket weather, Coralie says, and sits down at Meemaw's old sewing machine in the corner. I stare some more. 
corduroys, sweaters, jeans, t-shirts, two winter dresses, and three summer ones. Behind me, I hear the pump, pump, whir of the sewing machine. Coralie's got her foot to the pedal, and the empty needle bobs up and down. Do I have to wear a dress? Do I look like your mother? No, no, you do not. Mom pipes in. Honey, I'm not sure about this. It is 25 degrees out, she puts a hand to the window. Why don't your friends stay here? You can all watch a movie. We haven't said more than two words since I found her with those papers for Grandpa last night. I'm going. Where are my red leggings? Oh, I've got just the perfect thing to go with those. Coralie jumps up and runs down the hallway. I hear the door open and slam shut. I can't hear anything else. I wonder what Bert's doing in there with Meemaw and Grandpa, probably reciting the state capitals or mapping the stars or something. Mom turns from the window, and her hand leaves a foggy outline like a ghost. You need more than leggings. Where's your long underwear? I'm not wearing long underwear. Ellie, I do not want you to catch a cold. I yank on my leggings, but I can't get them all the way up. It's easier on the bed but I, want, I don't want to take the time to get myself out of my chair. I am not a baby, I say, which would have been much more impressive if she had been pulling my leggings up over my bottom. I know that. I don't think you do. I hear the door open and shut and Coralie's feet pounding down the hallway. Got him! She's holding her white sweatshirt with a glitter heart and a red feather boa. The best thing about mom driving is that I can pretend she's not there. Bert's up front giving directions because he won't tell her even where we're going, which proves he is much cooler than people give him credit for. It's mid-afternoon now, but still sunny shine, and I close my eyes for just a minute because it's warm in here. Next to me, Coralie is humming something about the Chattaku River, and already this is better than any old dance. Half an hour later, we pull into a parking lot. It's totally empty. There's a white fence running around the block with a tiny building about the size of Meemaw's canning shed in front. And that's it. I can't see what's behind the fence. We'll take it from here, Miss Cohen. Bert holds his hand out to shake hers, but she ignores him. She's squinting at the buildings as we all unload. I say buildings, but now that I'm closer, I think technically it's what you would call a shack. Like the kind they serve snow cones from the beach. The walls are big sheets of plywood nailed together and painted white like the fence. There's a counter, but it's taller than I can see over. Bert runs around the back and pops up behind the counter like a puppet. He unrolls a canvas sign and it falls down the front. I read in bright blue letters, Bill and Will's Putt-Putt Emporium. Ta-da, Coralie says and twirls in a circle. Miniature golf is the perfect anti-Valentine's Day activity, right? Mom shakes her head. Ladies, Bert says and passes down golf clubs. Bill and Will, I say. My twin brothers. They built the place. Your parents named your brothers Bill and Will? He shrugs. They didn't know they were having twins. They only picked out one name. We chose our ball colors out of a bucket. I'm purple, Coralie's red, and Bert's blue. While we wait for Bert to unlock the gate, Mom leans over me and taps my jacket where I've got my phone. Her breath makes a cloud. I'll be here if you need me. You call me when you're done or if it gets too cold. I nod, but when she tries to stuff mittens in my pocket, I roll away. Everybody knows you can't play miniature ball golf with mittens. The gate creaks open and Bert waves us inside with his club over his shoulder. Let's do this, Coralie yells and races through. It's a proper 18-hole course, and it's kind of amazing. It's got a western theme. There are holes that look like saloons and deserts and a train filled with gold. There's even one with a horse's tail that swishes back and forth in front of the hole when you turn on the switch. I can't believe your brothers did all this. They're on a scholarship for engineering, he says. Like, of course it's totally normal to build a full-size miniature golf course in your spare time. I'm beginning to think Bert is the most normal one in his family. Me first, Coralie yells. Hold on, hold on. Bert pulls a tiny scorecard and pencil out of his white jacket pocket. He looks like the guy in the front of the popcorn box or Colonel Sanders. We have to make it official. Whatever, Coralie says and drops her ball. I smile. They have no idea. Coralie hits like she's trying to make it to the moon. Her ball flies off the rocks and back down the green. One time she has to chase it into the parking lot. Bert is worse. 
He's so precise it takes him five minutes to line up a shot, but he almost always gets it in the hole in two or three swings. By the fifth hole, they both stand back and watch when I roll up to tee off. What I did not tell them when we pulled up is that I have been playing miniature golf since I was three. Mom and I went to the fun park out near the mall all the time in the summer, while the other kids ran off to the go-karts and the bumper cars and the arcade. I stayed with Mom on the greens. And so now, after nine years of practice, I can line up, lean over, hit the ball one-handed, and get it in the hole in one almost every time. Mini golf is my jam. You're like a golf goddess, Coralie says when I hit one over the water and through the Grand Canyon to the hole on the other side. My hands are freezing and I can't really feel the club, but I nod. Yes, yes I am. It's getting darker now, and I think of the other kids heading off to the dance and feel sorry for them. Did you know that seven men died in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in 1929? Bert, geez, filter, remember? You're up anyway, Coralie says. He lines up his shot for three minutes and then finally swings, but misses the hole that is just to the left of a wooden cactus. It's only by half an inch, but a miss is a miss. He takes out his scorecard, makes a note, and then walks forward. He's still talking when he steps up and taps his ball in. Well, did you know that St. Valentine was a priest who was martyred and bur buried on February 14th in a city near Rome? Bert, I poke him in the shoulder with my club. My point is, you two, that miniature golf is a much more appropriate pastime for Valentine's Day than a dance or date or dinner. Romance has no place on this holiday. Except dinner sounds good now. I wipe my nose on my sleeve. Okay, Coralie says, this is the last hole, then dinner. But I grab both her clubs before she can take a running start. Even though I'm pretty sure my toes are blue inside my boots, I still want a minute to take a mental picture of all of us head to toe in red and white like candy canes on the 18th hole. My club is across my lap, and I can hear the water from the ho hose running through the canyon. It's perfect. It's the best Valentine's Day, or any day, really, I've ever had. What, Coralie says? Nothing, just sizing up my victory shot. Nah, don't you know the rules? Whoever gets a hole in one on the last hole is the real winner. She takes a flying leap, and we all duck when her ball shoots off the bucket of gold on the little wooden train and comes flying back at us. Bert catches it with surprising reflexes. I, of course, take the hole in one. We stop at the Dairy Queen on the way home and pick up burgers and chocolate-dipped cones. It's so cold even in the van with the heater running. I have time to eat my entire burger before the cone starts to melt. It's completely dark when we roll down the gravel drive after dropping off Bert and Coralie. Mom and I sit in the car for a minute. I'm so tired, I close my eyes. Did you have fun, sweetheart? Yeah, I did. And you're glad we're here? I'm glad we're here. And school's better? At least better than it was? The teachers are giving you enough time between classes, and you're all right without an aid? Yeah, Mom, things are better. Better, but still not great, I don't say. People still don't really look at me or talk to me, other than adults and Bert and Coralie. But then again, nobody really talks to anyone but their own friend group anyway. Good, good. I just want to know you're taken care of, she says, reaching her arm back and rubbing my knee. And I'm sorry about last night. I'm sorry you had to find out that way. Grandpa's not going anywhere for a long time, I promise, okay? Okay, can we go in now? I want to believe her. I do, but I can't get that picture of Autumn Leaves brochure out of my head. This is the first time all night I really felt the cold. I spend all of Sunday, the day before my speech, blowing my nose, but I don't mind because miniature golf finally gave me an idea.